So if you all have the program, right? So the overall topic of the discussion today is around researching knowledge, decolonization, and the quest for inclusivity and social justice. So on the panel, we have Professor Aslam, Dr. Sanzuayo, who recently got his PhD for votes. In fact, he's quite popular on Twitter. I follow him on Twitter. Then we also have uh, Dr. Anne. So how the conversation is going to work is that I'm going to first give a historical context of South Africa and where we find ourselves today in relation to knowledge and decolonization. Thereafter, Professor Aslam would actually respond to a question that I would pose to him. So he would be given roughly 20 to 25 minutes to respond. Thereafter, the two panelists would actually respond to what he has actually said. Then there will be a bit of conversation between them. Then we'll open it up to the floor for you to actually comment and ask questions. Okay, fine. So, in terms of the historical context, and if you look at South Africa, for me, since the dawn of colonialism, what has happened in South Africa is that the education system has for many years been a battlefield for various ideologies. So of serious concern after 1994 has been the use of the education system as a site of as a site for reproduction of every kind of coloniality one can think of. As a result of that, what happened is that we have weakness, ecocides, ethnocides, epistemic sites, cultural sites, as well as linguicides and marginalization of indigenous ontologies and traditions of and uh, traditions. And additionally, the education system has been used to justify the dispossession of indigenous people of their ancestral land. This was largely informed by pseudo-scientific studies. Also what has happened in relation to the history of land dispossession in South Africa is that it can be traced as far back as 1652 with the arrival of Jan van Riebeck. As 1652 actually became a marker for the first European settlement at the Cape. The land dispossession was also accelerated by discoveries of diamonds and gold, respectively, as well as the 1913 Land Act, Native Land Act, which consolidated land dispossession and prohibited the majority of indigenous people from buying and owning 93% of South Africa's land. The act propelled one guy who I actually hold, who I respect the most. He was called, or his name rather was Ekicho Plaki, who was the ANC leader at the time. He traveled all over the country on bicycle actually really searching about the impact of the law on ordinary indigenous people's life. He used his ethnographic research findings to pen Native Life in South Africa, which was first published in 1916, in which he spoke against the horrible treatment of indigenous people by colonizers and settlers. In his revealing words, Teki Shop pronounced that Awakening on Friday morning, June 20, 1913, the South African native found himself not actually a slave, but a parai in the land of his birth. Fast forward in 2015, many South African university students, including myself, welcomed some progressive academics inspired by the generation of 1950 uh, right African scholars called for the decolonization and Africanization of university spaces and curricula. These calls were made because of the frustrations that we experienced. 
frustrations informed and shaped by the inaction of university management as well as the government to transform the content pedagogy as well as curriculum and the spaces of the university since 1994. So what we have done was that we expressed our frustration through movements such as the Transform Bits at this very campus, the Roads Must Fall at the University of Cape Town, Open Stellenbosch, as well as Leicester at the University of Stellenbosch, UP Uprising at the University of Pretoria, as well as the Fees Must Fall, which actually happened in all institutions of higher learning in South Africa. So under this movement, we made demands. And some of these demands included making higher education more inclusive and accessible, insourcing of workers, removal of colonial public representations, as well as establishment of rules to deal with anti-black racism in institutional culture, and increasing the numbers of African academics, especially in uh, prof uh, professorial ranks. A major focus of the 2015 movements also dealt with the decentering of the colonial past within the curriculum and spaces of the university. Thus, the reimagining, rearticulating, recentering, repositioning African knowledges, ontologies, epistemologies, pedagogies, cultures, histories, and languages, with the hope of Africanizing, rehumanizing the dehumanized. This could be said to be serious, uh, to be reasons why students' movements emerged in 2015. And this could be summarized in what the Council of Higher Education actually referred to as fundamental change in the nature, identity of such institutions and a dismantling of the apparatus that is perceived to support and continue colonial legacy, what appears to be understood mainly as what is taught requiring Africanization or indigenization of the syllabus to become more relevant to a changing student population. So with that said, I would like to pose this question to Professor Fatah. So the question is, what's at stake when we research knowledge practices with the view of advancing social justice? What are the challenges, dangers, and opportunities of this? Okay, got it. Thank you very much. I needed that. Um, um, I, I like to thank uh, Professor Rusnek for uh, graciously organizing this. So I'm, 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 I'm sort of proceeding quite eclectically today. Um, some would say pragmatically, but that's, uh, that, that's not the proper word. <laughs> I'm establishing a conversation uh, about knowledge as it's manifesting in higher education via certain kinds of conceptualizations. Social justice, inclusivity, um, um, and so on. But I'm seriously attempting also to read the question through my initial profound, profoundly reading of LCT. Now, it's a profoundly reading that I've been doing over the last couple of months. It's not conceptually accurate, so I want you to listen to sort of the outlines of the argument instead of fixating on the conceptual precision, which I'm sure I'm going to violate today. <laughs> um, I've called my presentation uh, towards a pathway to pursue knowledge building in South African higher education. I start this presentation by offering some theoretical positioning in the search for cumulative knowledge building. I support the commitment to uh, knowledge as involving principled, boundary and cross-boundary constructions and that cumulative knowledge growth is the central organizing frame that informs social and epistemic processes. Today, I would like to emphasize the view that knowledge building occurs in contested and complex educational field dynamics, which our colleague uh, Paul has alluded to in the introduction. 
I base my presentation on the proposition that the commitment to knowledge and knowledge building must be located in the cauldron of a highly contested South African higher education field. Uh, I choose to focus on one key aspect of LCT, namely the epistemic semantic pedagogic device. Drawn from uh, or based on Bernstein's uh, pedagogic device, LCT's epistemic pedagogic device emphasizes the productive and recursive interaction among the three dimensions of knowledge production logics, recontextualization logics, and its pedagogical and evaluation reproduction logics. And the argument that I pay attention to today is how the pedagogic reproduction logics of the epistemic pedagogic device works backwards to influence the logics in the other two domains. I start with the proposition that knowledge building, as it has emerged in the South African education academic field, has manifested over the last two decades and more potentially in respect of under-articulated and polarizing knowledge, knowledge contests among erstwhile racially constituted academic tribes and territories. This has led to polarization, fracture, and a lack of cumulative knowledge building, something which manifests, for example, in many faculties of education in this country, in their research, in their, in their curriculum, in their uh, programs. An example of which is my faculty at Southern Bosch University. In this light, I have become committed to what I refer to as a type of epistemic pluralism, as one way of overcoming this fragmentation. This is not simply a pragmatic position, although myself being located in some uh, uh, way, uh, in multiple ways on the higher education field at Stellenbosch University and beyond, there is a sense of pragmatism that drives how I proceed. However, I contend that there are at least four knowledge frames that have to be brought into view if we were to take knowledge building in South Africa seriously. The first is a social realist or Bernsteinian position based on the distinction between horizontal and vertical discourses and horizontal and vertical knowledge structures. And this view, I observed, is productively elaborated on, beyond binaries, by LCT, whose specialization code perspective is based on a distinction between knowing and knowledge as a means of bringing the code dynamics of vertical and horizontal structures into view. This in turn informs LCT's call, uh, call for uh, uh, focus on epistemic relations of knower discourses and the social relations of knowledge discourses. That's all very familiar to you. The second knowledge position can broadly be called a social justice position, a position that I have written, and, uh, written on. This is a social justice perspective of knowledge, which I argue, on my reading, emphasizes the principle <coughs> and dialectical, not collapsed, interaction between vertical and horizontal knowledge across the entire pedagogic device, not just pedagogy, as Michael Young would have it. This perspective emphasizes the dynamic interaction between life world knowledge and disciplinary knowledge in pursuit of giving effect to knowledge distribution, knowledge and its representation, and an active knowledge, participative, dynamic, dynamic, following Nancy Fraser. These two perspectives, social realism and social justice, I argue, each has a very specific theory of knowledge which is worth highlighting, but as I highlighted, I do not want to set it up as a kind of binary, but I just want to go to the heart of it because that's where from where I think we have to go. Social realism favors the theory of knowledge, qua knowledge. In other words, the focus is directed to the internal relations of knowledge. Social justice favors the theory of knowledge qua reflexivity and social change, not qua knowledge. In other words, the focus is directed 
to the external relations of knowledge. Social realism offers a commitment to ethics based on an emphasis on epistemological axis. Social justice prefers a commitment to an ethics based on social change and transformation. These are not mutually exclusive. It is just the primary impulses that I'm trying to identify. I claim that for social realism, modern knowledge or modernity's knowledge or the knowledge of the Enlightenment is fairly settled epistemologically. That is quite a claim, but I hope to defend it. <laughs> and for social justice, modern knowledge, while also settled, because it's a variation of modern knowledge, is somewhat open, always plural, and somewhat, uns somewhat unsettled. The higher education field has two other contending knowledge perspectives. One existentially dominant, and the other has a normative subordinate location in the field. The first is what I call geneticism on steroids, or hypergeneticism. I hesitate to call it knowledge, but it is a, this knowledge constellation, I argue, emanates from the economic field via hypertechnologization. This constellation has landed in the dominant part of the higher education field, and its dominant discursive logic is an emphasis on skills or knowing how. The second knowledge perspective is decolonizing knowledge which is a normative knowledge position knocking on the door from a subordinate location or a super subordinate location in the higher education field. Propelled as it is by misrecognized black students and academics from dominated university sectors. In other words, these two contending knowledge perspectives have been present in what I argue is the knowledge agenda field operations. I argue that a hypergenericism must be understood, researched and responded to and challenged at all levels of the epistemic pedagogic device based on its proper and vigorous theorization, its living inside our knowledge environments not to be dismissed as knowledge blind. And decoloniality, on the other hand, must be centered in the epistemic domain, not in the affective domain, or, and so on, in the epistemic domain of the university, over the long term, via its cumulative knowledge building insertion as part of the distinctive knowledge claims uh, that social realism and social justice approaches also make. I argue, therefore, that a commitment to epistemic pluralism in the South African higher education field ought to center hitherto incommensurable knowledge claims into a disciplined and disciplining knowledge building conversation, which would involve inter alia uh, social social realism's emphasis on knowledge qua knowledge, or politically, I know, therefore I become. Social justice's knowledge qua reflexity, I know, therefore I act. Decolonial knowledge's emphasis on the knowledge, on the knowledge and knows as inseparable, I am, therefore I know, and I know, therefore I am. All of these put something on the table. All of these have blind spots which should not be avoided but should be engaged with. And of course, hypergeneticism's hegemonic operations has to be confronted. It issues into what Sia reminded me yesterday, a kind of knowing and knowledge blindness. Let me quickly discuss the discursive profile of hypergeneticism. Genericism has been with us for more than 30 years, we know that. 
It has accelerated rapidly during the last decade and has received policy prominence via the South African state's currently favored discourse around the fourth industrial revolution. I hope the international guest missed it, but they couldn't remember. <laughs> Ipogeneticism denotes the merging of biotechnology and information technology via seamless superfast connectivity, giving rise to an economy based on big data, machine learning, algorithms, and robots, and so on. This fourth industrial revolution discourse is propelled by the promise of addressing human development on the one and that's how it's being sold, and the fear of human redundancy on the other. The changing nature of work is touted as one key reason for planting skills as a panacea to the problems created by this new capitalizing form. Constant and disorientating change has raised questions about what it means to be human, and there is popular conjecture about unknowable futures. Rousing calls have been made for economic and educational responsiveness. So these descriptions and conjectures are captured in Yuval Hariri's trilogy of books, 2015, 2017, 2018. You're all familiar with Yuval Hariri's text. I would highly recommend that you read it. I'm getting there. Hypogeneticism has come to dominate the South African government's policy discourse via its fourth industrial revolution presidential commission, various joint up ministry processes, and its strong skills agenda. I argue that this is the discourse that speaks us and will be speaking us more powerfully as we go forward. And the universities have, for example, responded to the 4IR imperative based on their specific apartheid bequeathed histories and institutional infrastructure now really worked in the current period. One university, for example, has framed its entire operations on 4IR, ch chasing niche recognition. Another university concentrates, my university, let me say, concentrates on data science and computational thinking to chase 4IR's capitalizing logics. And a third university, let me say, this university, has propelled strategic sectors in the university to respond via niche maintenance. We can speak about that sociologically later on if you want. The educational emphasis in the response of universities is on reforming qualifications, pursuing cross trans part disciplinary combinations for specific program mixes and so on. It's all the rage in the institutional environments of these, uh, the regular, uh, in the managerial environments of these universities. Interesting to note that the pedagogic reproduction logics that are emerging. First is an emphasis on new literacies involving technological literacy, data literacy, and something called human literacy. The second emphasis is on cognitive capacities such as critical thinking, systems thinking, entrepreneurship, and cultural agility. And third, with respect to how to teach, the focus is on problem-based learning, learning in practice, hands-on projects, and real-world connections. It's clear for me, well, it's not that clear, but the emergent for our knower is touted as a future-proof knower. Hypogeneticism's implications for the epistemic pedagogic device can be, uh, the question can be posed whether this is a case of the pedagogical reproduction tail wagging the knowledge of distribution and curriculum recontextualizing dog. Or put another way, is this a noble futures type of knowing? To coin a phrase, the new discourse. Let's speak. Turning to the centering of decolonial knowledge, Coloniality is based on a decentering of modern Eurocentric knowledge and a recentering of, of epistemic pluralism, an ecology of knowledge's approach. And in the South African context, the centering of Africa centered knowledge inside the knowledge building project. That's where the challenge lies. This requires, however, as far as I'm concerned, one to address one key shortcoming, one of many, many key shortcomings of this decolonial imperative. And that is that it lacks knowledge building tools. I try to address this shortcoming for my, in my own module by working the epistemic pedagogic device. I developed a type of translation device based on advancing what counts as knowledge claims 
based on a deep learning approach. And then I operationalize these knowledge claims via LCT concepts such as specialization and semantics and so on. So on. This provided me a deep learning knowledge approach upon which I was able to carefully select texts, mobilize contexts, carefully scaffold, sequence and pace, and weave between open and closed classification and framing in order to secure optimal student recognition and knowledge engagement. And if truth be told, speaking autobiographically and completely unreflexively, I'm getting somewhere. <laughs> so what was beginning to emerge in my class, based on a knowledge building approach, was a deep learning model, or as Kathy Luckett, oh she's here, as Kathy Luckett calls it, a deep learning gaze. In other words, what emerges is a complex knower, able to work with plural knowledges in careful and disciplined, non essentializing ways. Finally, let me attempt to summarize my argument. I argue that the knowledge building task has to be based on a type of knowledge articulation of plural knowledge perspectives in a disciplined and disciplining conversation inside the context field of higher education. That each perspective has core strengths but also blind spots. The blind spots are where the initial theorization has to be located, questions raised, and problems identified. Working through these blind spots requires an openness to recognizing shortcomings, identifying alternative knowledge perspectives, and an application of new theoretical tools to old and new problems as and when they emerge. In fact, we are invited by Mayton and Howard. Um, I'm hoping he's here. I haven't actually met him. Uh, hello. Uh, Mayton and Howard to engage in exactly such class where they explain. <coughs> this is not me being pragmatic. I really think it's important. To explore integrative knowledge building thus requires breaking with pre-constructed categories in favor of concepts that can, on the one hand, explain the heterogeneous mutable and situational nature of knowledge practices without, on the other hand, succumbing to relativist practices. Thank you very much. That was stimulating. I think you all now have questions that you want to ask, but before we get to that, I will give Dr. Helene a chance to try to respond. Possible contribution I can make here is 
what we found LCT to be valuable for in this specific conversation, we, our, our interest started, um, mine started. Uh, let me say that as well. When I talk here, I don't talk from, for myself only. I talk from my heart. That's me. But the decolonization work that I'm doing is in partnership with Max Blackie, which is at the back, not at the back, to the south, <laughs> to the front. Um, and my insights about it um, has not been reached on my own. He's been in interaction with Max going backwards and forwards and, and suddenly coming to an insight about the conversation. So that's where we are. We're hoping to move towards what it means in science. One of my first impressions was, or first questions was, is decolonization in science the same as this, the same as it is in humanities? Do these calls apply to science in exactly the same way, or is there something different there? We've got to be very careful with that question because it's one I'm very familiar with in science. Whenever I take something there, they tell me, oh no, it doesn't work this way in science. It becomes a hiding place quickly. Um, so, being a scientist, I wanted to understand. I wanted to go deeper and see if we could figure out what was going on. The other honest position to take then is when I started, when I read for LCT2 to give the paper there, I went through so many emotions. I read a paper by a decolonization scholar, my, I didn't read Professor Patel's then, but it might have been his as well. And my first reaction would be, this cannot be, that this cannot be the truth. And as you continue reading, I changed how I thought and who I was. And, and then LCT provided a framework with which to do that. So, um, Professor Fertiles highlighted enough uh, uh, where he spoke about the social relations in knowledge-driven practices or the knowledge code. I think that's where Max and I are working at the moment. Our argument in at LCT2 was we started from a position taken from Carl's work that science painted in broad strokes probably is a knowledge field and the calls for decolonization originates in fields that are probably never code-driven. So that constitutes a code clash. Constitutes a code clash in numerous ways. Um, in science, in knowledge code fields, it matters what I know. Professor Patel spoke about that. Um, not so much what I bring to the party, who I am, my dispositions, values, attitudes, etc. That's exactly the opposite to know code fields. But another thing to me which is quite interesting is in a knowledge code field, the knowledge is hierarchically situated. So knowledge builds, one big builds on the other. And um, Taking, the go, uh, taking it to its extreme, the knower is subservient to knowledge in science. And one might, might almost argue, if I really want to take it to an extreme, that we can substitute one knower for another and hope to get to the same end result. It's the opposite, I think, uh, from what I read, in knower code disciplines, where knowledge is sub subservient to knower building. It's used to build knowers. And one might be able to substitute one knowledge, one bit of knowledge for another and still get to the same end result. So what happens in the conversation between decolonization calls and science is science is reading those calls through its knowledge curve register and it's hearing throw out science. It's hearing throw out the basis, which means the whole house of cards tumbles down. Um, and, and that was a key insight for me already, just to see that that is a code clash happening right there. Okay, so that doesn't take us very far. We then postulated that LCT helps us see the code clash, but also helps us possibly see how to mediate that conversation. So we might need someone sticking with a specialization plan that it can operate in the elite code, that can speak both knowledge and knower code. But who is that person? So then now, I'd like to just share three examples without taking too much time from my own practice. And that is what I can speak of, about with some authority <laughs> and some authenticity. So following LCT2, I was called in later that year into a conversation with faculty management, not the science faculty, our deputy dean is here, another faculty that science and life at Stellenbosch University, where they tried to have, um, without saying who they are, so it was not humanity, social sciences, any of those fields, but they tried to have a decolonization conversation with hopefully best intentions. And it, I wasn't there, so um, I don't have first time knowledge, but I was told that it went wrong in the most spectacular ways. It just didn't work and faculty management was not open to have further conversations on this topic. So given that um, I came back and, and um, Cecilia shared with our colleagues some of the work that we did, we did at LCT2, colleagues of mine working in the faculty asked if I would just have a conversation around the LCT insights with management of that faculty. Um, and I'm sharing this here because it was such a profound experience. You know those moments you walk into a room and you can cut the air with a knife. 
the resistance is just thick in the air. And that's how it felt. It was a, an informal conversation around the round table. I didn't go in with tech or anything. But it was just resistance up, all shields up. And as we work through the concepts of specialization and for what it shows in terms of the code clash and how we could mediate the conversation, you could feel the resistance melting and faculty management starting to engage in the conversation. I had not experienced anything like that before. I, of course, am at LCT, that's why I'm at this conference again. And, and I'm at risk of, of that old saying of if you only do as a hammer. You'll be getting everything up the nail, so I have at risk of LCT becoming a hammer. But um, following that, Max and I were invited to present the LCT paper a number of times again. We were asked, we had presented it at one of the full teaching and learning seminars at Stonewall University, the National Science Dean's Forum based on the teaching and learning seminar, then a selected group of students at UWC based on the Dean's Forum presentation. And from all of that, each time we got the same kind of response. Scientists were suddenly very positive and ready to communicate and to engage around this topic. I'll share one bit of feedback on that. After the teaching and learning seminar at Stanford University, a colleague who I've known for a long time, who is never, never tries to be politically correct and is very outspoken, came to me and said, this is the first time this topic doesn't sound like gibberish to me. Now, if you don't know, gibberish is coding science for anything relative to scope. <laughs> so, um, that colleague, that was an about turn or decolonization for her from previous conversations. And she's attended subsequent conversations on the topic. Um, more recently, Max and I, more Max than I, facilitated a workshop on decolonization on the science faculty at Stonewall University. Um, and in this workshop, we had similar responses, but I want to highlight three things that happened there because that to me was almost as profound as that conversation with the faculty management. A colleague who's on the transformation committee, one of the transformation committees at Stellenbosch University, asked during the workshop, do you know of any other similar cases where a framework has been brought to be on the decolonization conversation, similar things to LCT? And I thought that was quite an interesting question to ask. Um, then, at the end of the workshop, another colleague, who I know from way back when, when he gave us all our days in another teaching and learning seminar, also very, very outspoken, came to me after the workshop, thanked me and Max for it, and said the following. He said, and he's senior and, and respected in his field, I was very scared of coming to the session today because I didn't know what to expect, but this far surpassed my expectations. But most <coughs> interestingly and importantly, that conversation went deep into social relations. So that knowledge code field, and that was the argument Max and I were trying to make. The space was just created. Um, we had colleagues who had our first-hand experiences of colonialism and, what it, and the results of that, sharing their personal experience of that in Stellenbosch University. Um, and we had colleagues responding to that in a different way to usually open to listening and to learning from perspectives that differ from their own. I've never seen that happen in science before. And on top of that, science decided that they don't want to go back to the faculty and handle this under the heading of alienation. Um, I love using the word decolonization when we set up these conversations because I like that whole messy business to come into it and then get to another point out of it. But for a group of scientists to get to that point in time, I don't know what else could have brought us there. So my own experience is that LCT has not only helped us to understand how to mediate, but it's actually helped to act as the mediating tool in these conversations. What its value might be if you're not in science, because this is between, because of a code clash that happens due to the knowledge codes in science versus where these schools come from, that is for people, I think, in the other types of operating in, code, in, in disciplines that have other knowledge codes to figure out. Um, but um, in science, definitely, we've been, uh, I am just honored and humbled and always in awe for how scientists react. And to summarize in that, my feelings then, if I, <clears throat> if I should try to theorize it very briefly, it's not really theorizing at all. I think scientists interact with the world through frameworks. We constantly find to make sense of things that we see when none of us can see the atom and the quarks that Jagen spoke about on Monday. 
Um, but we see the effects of those, and we try to make sense of that through frameworks. And LCT offers scientists a framework from the, which they can make sense of the decolonization conversation. <coughs> Thank you, Tobe. So now we're going to give Dr. Sajdrayo space to respond. But thereafter, I think we'll bring Max into the conversation because it appears as if we have worked hand in hand with Dr. Helene a lot. So if we can hear what you would say after Dr. Sajdrayo. Thank you. Uh, Prof. Aslam, I cannot thank you enough for, for that very insightful presentation. Um, I think for me, decolonization more than anything else has been, has been phenomenological, has been a personal journey for me because I started, when I started my first year at Rhodes University, I knew it literally took me less than two hours to see that something was different here. I didn't have the theoretical tools, I didn't have any conceptual framework, but there was just something about me not belonging there or feeling alienated or feeling that that space does either A, does not reflect who I am in my cultural practice or B, I'm sort of like, I think power calls it space invader. That's what it kept uh, a feeling like. And it didn't take me too long um, to struggle. And this is not just uh, 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 in terms of the curriculum and the knowledge so that whole ER++, it's, it's, it's not even about that. But I think just more than anything else, just socially and adjusting the culture, the ceremonies, the serenading, the practices, it was geared towards a particular kind of student. It was not geared to this township boy from Soweto. Everything else was just very alienating. And so, uh, in a way, when the 2015-2016 moment started, uh, it spoke really personal to me because it linked quite closely with my master's research as well as my PhD research. Because for my master's research, I was looking at the experiences of first generation black working class students who are the first in their family to come to university. In a way, trying to understand myself. Am I the only one? Is this common? What's happening and stuff like that. And so the more I researched on that is the more I had access to higher education literature, marginality, fervor, and things like that. Just basically giving me the theoretical and the conceptual tools to understand really that particular moment. So when the protest started, I was very active in them now. And it was interesting how for your historically black university, the issues were uh, fees, yes, fees was a big problem, accommodation, res, safety and security and things like that, maintenance and things like that. But for us at Rhodes University, it was around institutional culture. It was around an alienating curriculum. It was around teaching and learning. It was around the resident system and the way that it was structured. So that for me was one of the interesting things, was whenever we had to meet with uh, colleagues or comrades from Forte, uh, Walter Sassoon University and things like that, for them it was really, really the issues that I was facing in first year. But the struggles we were articulating uh, at that time for us at Rhodes University were something else. So for me, that was one of the interesting things that started coming out. And of course, then my PhD research in looking at how knowledge and laws are legitimated in the field of political studies is sort of a continuation on that. Whereas for my work in particular at Masters, I was looking at the social experiences more grounded, and for my PhD, I was looking at curriculum. And the interesting story that I liked to tell Sue, my, 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 my PhD supervisor, was that the PhD came the PhD idea came during one heated staff meeting where the postgraduate students were offering a critique at the political science department at Rhodes. And they were speaking about how it continues to teach dead white men, that's your Hobbes, your, 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 your John Rawls, and Heidegger, Derrida, Sartre. And they said there is no Afrocentric or African scholars and things like that. And one of the, 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 the senior colleagues just bent the table and stormed out and said, if we're not going to teach Hobbes, then for me, I'm not going to teach. It's not negotiable. Thomas Hobbes is not negotiable. So in a way, that was what my PhD was about. What, what was happening in that moment? And trying to understand decoloniality or decolonization from that part. So hence, I'm glad Prof. Aslam uh, started with the epistemic pedagogic device 
but you started from the back. And I've appreciated that because with Bernstein for me, the pedagogic device is very simple. It's the field of production, the recontextualizing field, as well as the field. And all of it is from one to this, from this to this. But I think the way Mayton shows it, it's how dialectical, right? So it doesn't always start from the field of production. It can very well start from the field of reproduction. And I think for me, looking at uh, the relationship between uh, LCT and decolonization and decoloniality, um, it's two things. I see the, the, the possibilities for future research in two ways. I think the first way is to look at the relationship more than anything else because the students themselves, right, protesting and arguing about curricular teaching and learning, institutional culture, spatial justice, uh, statues, artifacts, the name of the institution, uh, the culture that is legitimated in historically white university. And if you're looking at historically black university, their marginality, there's peripheral spaces they are continuing to occupy and things like that. Essentially, uh, to, to maybe to, to strengthen my SG++ now, is to, to emphasize maybe for, for, for the South Africans, it's the bantification, it's, 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 it's the homeland, it's the bantification, the homeland system that you historically black universities in South Africa still find themselves in. They are often in the townships, in the rural areas, and they are often not in the city centers. So that tends to reinforce their exclusion, marginality, and even access to, 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 to basic infrastructure that students would, would often need. So the first part for me, looking at LCT in relation to decolonization, it's to begin to look at the epistemic pedagogical device and to perhaps begin to analyze or provide an argument that even though the struggle seems to have occurred at the field of reproduction, right? The teaching and learning. So we don't want to learn about these dead white men. We want Biko, we want Fanon, we want Anoka Cabral, Spiva, Chakrabarti, and then, right? So even though the struggle and the contestation is happening at the field of reproduction, it has implications for the field of production and the recontextualizing field. Because that simply means that we now need to reimagine the way we produce new knowledge. Whose knowledge? What kind of knowledge are we producing? Who are we reading? Where are they coming from? And you also look, that also has implications for designing your own curricula, which would be a recontextualizing field as well right now. So which scholars am I going to include in my course online? Which scholar am I? What about my objective? Does it align with the, with the decolonial framework? To what extent does it align? How does it not align in those kinds of questions? So I think that's the first exciting opportunity that the EPD really does give us, is to begin to see the struggles, the contested struggles across all the different fields that students are happening in. They may be acting within the field of reproduction, but I do think they've got implications for the kind of knowledges that we are producing, and as well as the kind of curricular modules and courses uh, that we're choosing to, 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 to design. I think the second challenge for me, and I think this is where my research is, is more orientating towards, and it's a little bit exciting for now, is it's how differentiated and fragmented the decolonization school of thought is. So for example, uh, there are some who are speaking about decolonization, there are some who are speaking about decoloniality. What's the difference? There are some who are speaking about Africanization. Is that negligible? What about indigenous knowledge systems? Is that the same as Africanization? What about Pan-Africanism? Is that different? What about transformation, right? Because I believe the slogan from the University of Cape Town was very explicit that we don't just want to Africanize, we want to decolonize. What's the difference? And I think that's the space where your, your epistemic pedagogical device as well as your LCT can begin to, to map out all those conceptual uh, differences. And I suppose even reflecting Prof. Aslam's argument that it's not that the, the cumulative knowledge building still needs uh, to be done. A lot of theorizing still needs to be done. And I think those are the two frontiers. Uh, looking at the relationship between LCT and decolonization, those are the spaces that we, we, we should be exploring much more closely. The first one is the actors in the field of reproduction with student movements. Even though they are acting and they are contesting within the field of reproduction, they've got implications both for the recontextualizing as well as the field of production. What does that mean? Is, is, is that uh, the direction? Especially knowing that as early as the 1990s, Salim Patad, Ahmed Bawa, uh, uh, and Wali Moore were very clear about their classical understanding of epistemological access. Students must be faithful, respect the discipline, must not be arrogant, and must be prepared to, to teach, right? It's about a relational understanding of education. You cannot impart access to knowledge, right? It must be co-constructed. 
to what extent can LCT begin to intervene in those kind of struggles? And I think the second one is to sharpen our theoretical tools. What do we mean by decolonization? What do we mean by decoloniality? Negritude, what about pan-Africanism, Africanization, indigenous knowledge system? That's about six, seven different terms. And if you can see even in the literature, they're using some of them interchangeably. And that for me is a space where future theoretical research can begin. Because it's easy to bureaucratize and to technicalize the struggle. Because I know one university in Durban is doing that at the moment. And the university shall remain unnamed. <laughs> for safety and, and I'm trying not to look on that side, for safety and <laughs> social protection. <laughs> Where there's, 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 uh, one of their colleagues was showing us at a decolonial workshop with Maldonado Torres, uh, the, the, there's a pamphlet they have, how to decolonize is your motto, and you must tick the boxes and everything. <laughs> and <make sure. laughs> and so, is that what we mean, perhaps? And, 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 and that was quite interesting, the way that it was, uh, uh, appropriated, appropriated. But again, it shows uh, Prof. Fatal's argument about the strength of the neoliberal capitalistic uh, regime. It's quite strong that even in the modes of resistance, even when we're thinking about alternative counter-hegemonic ways of producing knowledge, we still have to subscribe to that uh, neoliberal technical regime where it needs to be profitable, it needs to be published, it needs to do this. So hence it's appropriate for our universities. So those uh, colleagues I think are the two frontiers um, that LCT can begin to help us to think through some of the solutions. Thank you. I think before we bring Max in, one thing that we all need to think about again is how we bring basic education into the conversation. And I say this because even if you look at the 2015-2016 movements, even in this conversation now, we have actually relegated basic education to mere lip service or is there. So if we are going to decolonize higher education and leave out basic education in its colonial state, so to say, what are we actually doing? So, a challenge for all of us, how then do we bring basic education into the conversations that we have around knowledge production, decolonization, and so forth. So, if we can have Max. Thanks very much. I just want to add um, a couple of things. I don't have an immediate answer to that question of basic education. I think it's a fantastic one, but I'm really not going to speak to that. Um, just two things that the work with Hanya has really helped me to see um, in this whole conversation. The one is recognizing, most of my colleagues happily came through the university system and made, all, made it through the university um, degrees and regulation time and didn't really struggle terribly much. That's how we end up as academics, right? Um, is recognizing that actually students do experience alienation. But that's a real experience. And if you, if you don't come from the field of science, you won't recognize how unbelievably mind-blowing that is as a possibility, right? That actually the student experience counts, is the point. Um, and the second crucial thing is that for, for those colleagues who, who got on board with the, well, we need to decolonize our curricula, the, the immediate answer was, okay, I'm going to start using South African examples in my class. And then, checkbox, that list, I've made it, and my curriculum is now decolonized because I'm talking about Roy Boss T. Um, I think we laugh, but actually, um, where what where Hanley, Hanley and I have got to in that conversation and what was so beautiful about that workshop that we held in the Faculty of Science is beginning to help scientists realize that your way of being in the classroom is the thing that you need to attend to. I can't be somebody who I'm not but understanding that actually the way that I present and the way that I engage with students is part of the problem. I can teach the same thing as one of my colleagues and students will have very different experiences of that. And again, to help scientists to recognize that 
It's a bit of an epiphany. Um, so that's just what I want to add to the conversation at this point. Thank you so much for that.